Mechanics. Yeah, that's a really good one. Okay, welcome to video number four in fluid mechanics. Today we're going to be starting section number two. Okay, so here's the breakdown of section two. We can see that it's called fluid statics, and I'll explain what that means in a minute here. But first, I want to talk about this breakdown a little bit. So section two is really the first part of this course where we're going to be diving into the fluid mechanics material. And you can see from the breakdown, I've actually split up the sections and their examples. And the reason I've done this is because some of my past students have asked to have the examples in separate videos. So what this video here, video number four, we're going to cover the white text. And then for each of the examples listed there, I'm actually going to make a complete separate video for each of the individual examples. Now that will make it easier for students to refer to the examples individually, but I want to really highlight something here and that's we remember from the earlier discussion about the philosophy of learning and looking at some of Richard Feynman's tweets, it's really important not to try to memorize these examples and to focus on the understanding. So it's really key here that the material we cover and the examples really go hand in hand. I wouldn't recommend one without the other at all. You really have to do both. And so make sure the order that you see them listed here, make sure you do them in that order. So for example, right after section 2.2 will be example 2.1. And I used to do those together. I think it's very important to have an example of what you just learned to really solidify the concepts. It's I think it's important to see that done in an example and vice versa. Make sure before you watch the examples, right, that you have the understanding from the material that came before it. And so to maximize your learning here, make sure you watch them in order and make sure you, you watch them fairly close together. Okay, now let's Let's get into a discussion about fluid statics and what it is and what our learning expectations are going to be. So what kind of things we're going to be able to calculate and understand uh, when we're finished this section. So let's start in on that now. We take a look at the title here and we're going to dissect what this title means. So we've already established what fluids are and we know that when we say something is static, that means that it's not in motion. So it's not moving. So what we're dealing with here with fluid statics are fluids that are not in motion. And from what we've covered so far, we've established that only fluids that are in motion can sustain a shear stress. So by saying fluid statics, what we're also inherently saying is that there aren't going to be any shear stresses. So we're not going to be dealing with any shear stresses in this section because uh, fluids that are stationary will only experience normal stresses, not any shear stresses. And of course, another reason that we're starting with fluid statics as our first real endeavor here into the, the fluid mechanics course is because treating the stationary fluids first, we'll be looking at the more simple form of the problem. So when we add in the flows later in the course, we'll see that that makes the problems more complex. So what we're going to start with is the easier, more simple problems, and then we'll build up from there as we go through the course. So so as engineers, we're interested in designing things and making things and how these equations are actually applicable in real life. So in talking about fluid statics, I want to start with a description there of, of sort of what we expect to calculate in this chapter, what we're going to learn and how we can use it, actually use it in practice. So I have a figure here. The first figure on the left is a dam. And so what we're basically looking at is a large reservoir of fluid. So all of this fluid shown here is held back by this large concrete dam. And we know, of course, without even completing this chapter, we know that there are huge pressures and huge resulting forces on this concrete. That's why it has to be so thick to hold back all of the water that's in this reservoir. And so one of the things we'll be calculating in this chapter is like, how do we figure out what those forces are? How do we calculate what the pressure is? And therefore, how do we make sure that this dam is capable of holding those forces? So another example of fluid statics is things like water towers or large vessels or large tanks. Essentially, anytime you have a, a big large container full of a fluid, the fluid is generally not moving in these cases. So that falls under fluid statics. And the kind of things we'd look at in a tower like this, for example, a lot of the problems we calculate look at when you have a tank and you have a little gate on the side and we want to know exactly what are the forces pushing on that gate so we can, you know, make sure again that that gate can withstand those fluid forces. So there might be a little gate or a door or something like that on the side of the water tank. And again, we'll want to know the pressure. So based on the level of water in this tank, we want to be able to calculate what sort of pressure can this water tank give us if it's going to feed some kind of system downstream of it. I've also shown some rain barrels. Again, you know, anytime we have a stationary fluid within a large vessel, this is going to be something that fluid statics handles. Again, we might want to know if there's a door on this thing, how much force is pushing against it. Or for example, these taps here, we might want to know how much pressure is coming out of these taps. And so, you know, what sort of uh, pressure we can get in our water
watering. And then another example I've shown here is a submarine. So again, anytime we have sort of a large stationary fluid, like for example, in this case, the ocean, and you want to put an object down within that fluid, there are going to be forces that are at play here as a result of the fluid, even though it's static. And so being able to calculate what sort of forces are acting on this submarine and design it effectively, that, that's something else that fluid statics will help us cover. These are just a few examples, but I think now you get the idea when we're done this chapter of all the sorts of things we should be able to calculate with what we learn. Okay, so we start with the basic equation of fluid statics. Now, I'm first going to derive this equation from scratch, and I want to make a few notes about that before we go through this. So oftentimes I get flack for going through the derivation because it's hard at the undergraduate level to sort of understand how you might apply this, how you might use this in everyday practice, right? So it's important to remember here that there are some things we're going to cover that you may not have to use in practice, right? But if I just gave you the equation in this chapter without showing you where it came from, there's a big gap there in terms of understanding exactly how and when it applies and being able to use it correctly. So one of the big reasons for showing you where these equations come from is to make sure that you understand how to use it properly and you understand the limitations that are imposed on the equation because of the way we derived it. Another reason is because if you do move on to do some more advanced fluid mechanics problems or you're looking at fluid mechanics for more innovative systems, you will actually be expected in some cases to do a derivation or come up with some equations yourself. And with that being said, I'm not going to show a full derivation in every situation. So I think this is one of those things. It's very important you see it at least once, but there will be a few cases in this course where we look at the derivation and then some cases where we don't look at the derivation. But it's important to remember sort of anytime you have a derivation, you follow the same general basic steps. So let's go ahead and do that here. So we begin with this basic cube. We can call it the fluid packet or fluid element. When we give it the dimensions of dx, dy, and dz, we now call that a differential element. So its size is these differential coordinates. We refer to it as a differential element, and now everything within it is a differential size. So its volume, for example, is dv, its mass is dm, etc. So we'll always be writing these quantities with the d's in front of them. Okay, now as I go through this, there's one other thing here that I'd like us to keep in mind. So I have found from teaching this course in the past that many engineers aren't really as comfortable as they could be with the calculus. And maybe there's the perception that, you know, mathematics is done by mathematicians, and so you do the calculus over in the calculus class, but actually that couldn't be further from the truth. So in courses like fluid mechanics and courses like heat transfer, we'll see a lot of the different phenomena are named after Newton. And see, Newton was also the developer of calculus. So there are actually some schools where they teach calculus and fluid mechanics together side by side, because the reality is Newton developed calculus in order to solve problems like we see in fluid mechanics. So actually, as engineers, we're using calculus the way it was developed, the way it was first intended. And so I'd like for us all to feel confident, to feel comfortable using it. So as I go through this, don't think of it as something for mathematicians. It's actually for engineers. Calculus was for us. And so Newton developed it so that he could understand fluid mechanics and be able to predict and design. And so as engineers, we can take charge of the calculus and we should really feel comfortable using it. And so that's just something I think we can all keep in mind as we go through this course is to really try to get comfortable with that calculus and know that it's sort of an integral part of doing the fluid mechanics. And we'll see when we see these fluid mechanics problems and how they're developed, we can sort of see where the calculus comes from. And I think that gives us the power over it to use it effectively. We can even understand it better and we can see that it's not that complicated. It's actually pretty straightforward when we can break things down like this. Now, what we're essentially going to be doing here is a force balance. And we mentioned there are really two different types of forces we can have. There are the body forces and then the surface forces. So if we get the body forces out of the way first, we mentioned that that would be gravity. So I've written that down here, body force DFB equals the gravity times the mass. And we can further simplify that by noting that this mass quantity can also be written as the density times the volume. A few notes here, so we're all on the same page. Those little arrows above each of the symbols, that denotes a vector. And these Vs with the slash through them, those refer to volume. And we do that because in fluid mechanics, we often have velocities and volumes, which typically are both written as Vs. So the volumes will always have that slash through it to denote that they're volumes. Okay, that takes care of the body forces. Now we move on to the surface forces. What we're going to do for surface forces is we're going to take a look at this differential element, and we're literally just going to look at each surface of this little cube here and ask what forces do we expect to be acting on that surface. Okay, we mentioned the surface forces can either be shear stresses or normal stresses. Because this is fluid statics, we can eliminate right off the top. We know there's not going to be any shear stresses, so we're only dealing with normal stresses. And in this case, the only normal stresses we're going to have are going to be the pressures that are acting on this little differential fluid element. So this differential element is centered about point O here, which is shown in the figure. And as the figure shows, we know the pressure at point O. So if we remember 
back a little bit to calculus. If we know the pressure at one point and we want to figure it out at another point, we can do a Taylor series expansion to figure that out. So we know the pressure here and we want to figure out what it is on the left face here. So we can write that as shown below where YL refers to the coordinate here and Y refers to the coordinate that we know at point O. And so in the expression written here, I've only kept the first two terms of the Taylor series expansion. And so we actually don't need any of the higher order terms. If we kept them, we'd see they'd be eliminated uh, later on in this process. And actually, if we take a moment to stop and look at it and, and reflect on that and kind of dissect it a little bit, I think it makes it sort of easier to understand. It's less esoteric. And this is part of us, you know, sort of taking control of the calculus here. And you can see, so we're saying that the PL, the pressure on the left face, is actually just the pressure at the center at point O, which is P. And then we add di P di Y, it's just a partial derivative. So it's the change in pressure in the Y direction. And then that's multiplied by that distance, right? So YL minus Y. And that, that's sort of intuitive if we, if we think about it, right? So we have a function that denotes the change of pressure in the Y direction. We multiply that by the difference. We travel in the Y direction. And so this would be applicable, you know, over very short distances or, or linear functions. That makes sense, right? So I have the pressure at one point. I add the pressure change in the Y direction multiplied by the distance I've traveled in the Y direction. And that's going to give me the pressure at the left face. Okay, now we can simplify this equation a little bit. So we can recognize from the figure that the length of the cube in the Y direction there is dy. So when we look at what the YL minus Y coordinate is, we see that that's actually half the distance along the cube there, but the negative, of course, because it's YL minus Y. So we can actually replace the YL minus Y by negative dy over 2. And finally, we rearrange, and then we do the same exact thing for the right face. I've only shown here the Y coordinates. We would do the same thing for the X faces and the Z faces as well. And now that we've established exactly what the pressure is that's acting on each of those faces, we know that the force that's resulting from this pressure is the pressure times the area. So for each face, now we're going to take that pressure value we just calculated multiplied by the area of each face. So I'll take one term here just to show clearly what we're talking about. So that's the left face that we just calculated. And then the area of that face is dx dz. So to get the sum of all the forces, we add all these terms up and that'll give us our total surface force. Then we simply collect all these terms and cancel them out. And what's left is the total surface force that's acting on this fluid element. I've written here a reminder for what the pressure gradient is is below. So if I want to simplify the surface force using the pressure gradient term there, I can write it like this. Okay, it's important to pause for a moment here. M make sure we're connected, we're grounded in, in physically what this is saying. So this is saying that at any point within our fluid, all the surface forces at any point is the negative pressure gradient times dx dy dz, which is the volume. So let's think about that for a second. The forces then are a result of the pressure gradient or the change in pressure. And how do we wrap our heads around that for a second? So I want to do another thought experiment. So think about this for a second. Put your hand up in the air. Now, if we're sitting in a still room, there's pressure acting on our hand, right? We know there's pressure from the air surrounding us. That's a static fluid for the most part. It's fair to say we can treat that as a static fluid. And then we have all this pressure acting on our hand, but we don't feel any force. Our hand is not being pushed in any one direction or the other if the fluid is fairly still. So it's clear from this example, and I'll show this with the hand in the slide here, that when we have a pressure acting on our hand or on any surface or any object, the pressure itself is not enough to induce a force because as we see from the picture, we're balancing. We're perfectly balanced on both sides. The pressure is the same, meaning the force that's caused by the pressure is perfectly balanced. So there is no net force on our hand. And that's why we know if we actually have a resultant force, Force, this DFS that's shown here, our surface forces, they have to come from a pressure gradient. So for example, if there was more pressure pushing on the left, we would feel a net force because the pressure on the right wouldn't balance it off. So we'd have a net force pushing on our hand to the right. So it's only therefore pressure gradients that cause forces. Okay, now for the total force, we just sum them all up. So all the surface forces and all the body forces. So we've got the pressure gradient and we've got our rho g term there. And we just simplify that one step more by noting that the dx dy dz is our volume. Okay, then we can write our force on a per unit volume basis. So we simplify that on the next line there. Okay, so we have all the forces that are acting on this fluid element, but that's not quite enough information yet. We still need to look to the laws of physics to see how these forces would actually alter or change this fluid. For that, we turn to uh, Newton's second law, which says that the net forces acting on this fluid element will be the mass times the acceleration. So that's written on this line here. So F equals the acceleration times the mass, dm in this case. We know 
dm is our density times our volume. And then because we're dealing with fluid statics, we know uh, what this equation equals. I'll give you a second to think about that. Just make sure we're all sort of on the same page here. So a fluid that is not in motion can't have any acceleration, right? So acceleration is zero. So what that means for rewriting Newton's second law, if we write it on a per unit volume basis as well, is the following. Okay, so that tells us that to have a proper force balance here, we have all these net forces that are acting on the fluid element. They must all equal to zero. And as always, in fluid mechanics, we're going to focus on really connecting between what the equations mean physically, not just treating them mathematically, but looking at their physical meaning. So this is something I'll focus on a lot, you'll see in assignment and exam questions, is to really get at the heart of what these terms terms mean in this equation. So I've written that below there, the term on the left, it's the net pressure force per unit volume at a point, and the term on the right, body force per unit volume at a point. Now that's a vector equation, so we would have three components in this equation, but if we align our Cartesian system according to the gravity vector, we can cancel off two of these components and have gravity that only acts in the z direction. So our vector equation simplifies then to di p di z equals negative rho g. And in words, what that's really saying is therefore all the body forces that are acting on these elements must therefore be balanced by surface forces. Or we could put that even more specifically, it's saying that gravity, so the force due to gravity, which is our body force, it's going to have to be balanced by pressure forces or pressure gradient, right? And so if we even dive a little more deeply here, so on the right hand side, we have negative rho g, and we know that the density is going to be positive and the gravity is going to be positive. So typically, if we're here on Earth, that'll be 9.81 meters per second squared. So on the right hand side, positive times a positive, and there's a negative in front of it. So the right hand side is going to be a negative value for sure. Means left hand side, of course, has to balance. That's going to be a negative value as, as well. So specifically, what that's saying there then is the left hand side is di p di z saying that that's the value of the pressure change in the z direction and we know that's negative so what that's telling us specifically is that the pressure goes down as the z coordinate goes up now remember we oriented ourselves the g z value was negative g so our z vector is pointing upwards right because gravity is going downwards so we could say then as the z value goes up the pressure goes down that's what it means when it's negative so negative means pressure is going down as z's going up or we could say conversely the pressure goes up as the z value goes down and we'll get into more detail on this later and we'll do some examples but ultimately so what that means is so the gravity forces in a static fluid mean that as you go deeper into a fluid the pressure goes up so going deeper means that z value is getting lower and lower and so the z value goes down the pressure goes up that's what we have when we have a negative gradient okay and because we only have the change in the one direction we don't need to write that as a partial we can write that as a full derivative so that finally simplifies to dp by dz equals negative rho g we remember that can also be referred to as the specific weight and then we should put a big box around that equation this is the equation we're going to be using uh, throughout the rest of this chapter. This is the equation of fluid statics. Okay, now pressure values are stated with respect to a reference point. When you see gauge pressure, if you just pick up a pressure gauge and you're at atmospheric pressure, that will show a value of zero. So each of the arrows in this figure refers to its zero point. So we look at the gauge scale at atmospheric pressure, that would read zero. But the zero point on the absolute pressure scale is actually referring back to vacuum. So that's where we get a zero pressure reading. So if we state the pressure relative to to vacuum, that's the absolute scale. Absolute pressure is also sometimes called the thermodynamic pressure because that's often the pressure we use when we're doing thermodynamic calculations. And then if we want to relate the gauge pressure and the absolute pressure, we use the following relationship. And yes, I've used the Canadian spelling of gauge there. So just as a quick example, if you throw a tire gauge on your uh, tire on your car, it might show you 30 PSI. But if you want to know the absolute pressure there, or if you're doing, say, a thermodynamic calculation, what would the actual pressure or the absolute pressure be within that tire. So we add the 14.7 and we have a total of 44.7 PSI, where PSI stands for pounds per square inch. I'll note here that that's the imperial unit. For the most part, we'll be sticking to SI units. So that's the kilopascal. And in all the evaluation questions, like exam questions, for example, we'll always be using uh, SI units. But for some discussions or examples, uh, we'll use both since both are used in practice in Canada, depending on the situation. Okay, so we go on now to section 2.2. And as I keep mentioning, as engineers, we always need to ground ourselves in how these things are used, how they're applied. So we'll be looking at, based on this equation then that we've just come up with, how can we calculate the pressure variation within a static fluid? So a lot of the examples I referred back to at the beginning there, it was what is the pressure at a certain location based on the depth in this fluid, or what is the pressure based on how much fluid is stored within the tank, etc. So let's write that 
equation again. So we're going to do this example here. And so we're going to figure out how the depth and the pressure are related. Okay, now I want to take a moment here to talk about incompressible versus compressible fluids. Now, when we say a fluid is incompressible, what we mean is that its density can't change. So there will be no density variation. And a compressible fluid then is the opposite. So in that case, we will have a density variation. And the reason we make this distinction is because, as we'll see in a moment, it simplifies our math tremendously. So this is a common distinction we'll see as we go throughout the course here. We'll oftentimes be referring to cases where we only deal with incompressible fluids or compressible. And so in this case here, what I'm going to do is simplify our equation only for incompressible fluids. So the equation that we're going to derive here will only be valid for incompressible fluids. That's why it's important to see where these equations come from. And you'll see this distinction again in a lot of other scenarios we go through this course because it simplifies the math we will want to look at incompressible cases separately now practically speaking so practically speaking what does that mean what does it mean to say that there's no change in density well typically when we talk about incompressible fluids we're talking about liquids and you can see that's a very broad category right so we will deal with liquids when there's no change in density right so that's why even though we make the simplification to talk about incompressible fluids it's still a very broadly applicable and then on the compressible side of things those will be gases typically because typically they can have a change in density but they don't always have a change in density so actually there are a lot of cases we'll see some as as we go through this course where the gases are treated as incompressible fluids because if we don't have a change in density you can still treat them as if they're incompressible and that would be cases where the density doesn't change that much so maybe the temperature doesn't change that much so if we don't have a big change in density we can also treat gases as incompressible so let's go through this simplification here and we'll see how it helps us and then remember now we're going to use this definition of incompressible and compressible throughout the course so we have to remember that it connects back to no change in density now on earth here like in many of the scenarios we're going to be looking at we're going to have a constant uh, gravity value so with constant gravity we have the resulting equation and we see that both terms on the right hand side are constant so the whole term must be a constant as well when we have a gradient dp by dz that's constant that implies that the pressure follows a linear behavior now to figure out what the pressure variation is we'll have to separate and integrate this expression and this is where we can see our simplification proving valuable for us this expression is now much easier to separate and integrate if we treat the density as constant meaning we know the density for example is not a function of z so therefore the math is much easier just as a quick side note here i write my rows with that little tail on them because uh previous classes had said they couldn't distinguish my p's and my rows so i try to make it obvious now so we complete that integration then and now we use this figure on the left to see what this means in terms of our engineering problems and say for example these tanks or reservoirs that we're going to be looking at so we integrated according to this reference level and pressure that was shown as the z naught and the p naught where we remember these little zeros on the letters here are generally used to indicate an initial or a start point or a reference level in this case so that might be for example the surface of our fluid that's shown there at point zero so that's the z naught p naught we remember the way we derived this we denoted the gravity according to a positive z scale so in this case if we're moving down the fluid, we have a coordinate at z that will be less than our z naught value, wherein we can see from the equation that our pressure will be greater than our p naught value, our value at the surface. And we can write the definition for our h there, our height value, as follows. What this equation then effectively is saying is that the change in pressure, or the delta p, as we move deeper into a fluid, is related to rho gh. And we remember a quick check there. As we go deeper in the fluid, we expect higher pressures. So again, anytime we sort of jumped in and swam to the bottom of a swimming pool we feel that pressure on our ears and submarines that are designed to go deeper within the ocean will have to then compensate for this fact that there are greater pressures at these lower depths so before we move on let's pause and look at that equation for one second and remember that this equation is just a simplified version of our core equation for fluid statics and this is the equation as engineers will prefer to use because p minus p naught equals rho gh or saying our delta p our change in pressure equals rho gh is a much nicer looking equation than the differential we had above and the reason we were able to do that is because we said it's incompressible because density is constant we can simplify now to this equation that's not in differential form anymore and that's the one we want to use so we keep in mind we can use that one so long as we have incompressible fluids okay so now we'll look at a manometer which is a great way to illustrate this principle but it's also good to know what a manometer is in practice so a manometer is really simple and inexpensive way to measure pressures and we'll see how okay so we look at the figure to see how we would use a manometer in practice so in this example the left hand side there is hooked up to something where we want to measure the pressure for example that's shown as blood pressure and the air within this tube here we consider the air within that tube to have 
have an equivalent pressure throughout. And that's really because the density is so low, we have a negligible amount of pressure difference over this depth. But with the liquids, we have to treat this change in depth with a change in pressure. So then we look at point A. So the blood pressure is now the reading at point A, and we want to calculate what the pressure at point A is. So the strategy here is to figure out what the value of that pressure at A is, we have to go back to a known pressure and then figure out the difference between the known pressure and the pressure at A. So our first strategy here is we look at point A and point A prime. And so we think back to our equation we just derived. So there's only a pressure difference as depth changes. So therefore, at any place where we have the same depth, we expect there to be the exact same pressure. So that tells us that the pressure at A is also the pressure at A prime. And then we can go back and use the equation we just derived. And we sub in the actual values for this. So P is PA and P naught is the pressure at B and the fluid is mercury. So we sub in. Okay, so we see how the manometer can be used to measure pressure. So because the manometer is open at point B, that's measuring atmospheric pressure here. So once we know that pressure, we can get all the other pressure points relative to that. And so then it just becomes a question of measuring that height very accurately. So you'll see on manometers, they'll have usually they'll have tick marks. So you can figure out exactly what the height level is. And therefore you can calculate the pressure. I'll list some general rules here for a multiple liquid manometer. So where we have different fluids within the manometer and many different levels, they sometimes use these because they can be more accurate. And so that says any two points at the same elevation in a continuous region of the same liquid or at the same pressure. So if you're in a single liquid and you have two points at the exact same height, they'll have the same pressure. And we establish that from the single manometer above. It's important to remember it has to be the same liquid though. And then point two, the pressure increases as you go down a liquid column. So this is a good way. It's a good rule of thumb to remember. Just think of yourself in the swimming pool, you go down, pressure goes up. So it's a quick way to just back check your calculations and make sure you've got it all on point. And then we can rewrite that equation there just in summation form. Effectively, it's the same thing though. Okay, now let's look at this for gases. So the first question is why does the previous section we just looked at for liquids not apply to the gases? And the main reason for that is because we assumed in those cases that the fluids were incompressible. But what happens with gases in many cases is there's a substantial variation in density for volumes that are filled with gases. And just a quick note to remember that we can sometimes treat gases as incompressible as well, so long as there isn't a variation in the density. But for the cases we're going to be looking at here, we're going to look at cases for gases when there is a variation in the density. That really just depends on the scenario we're looking at. So let's take a look then at what happens to our equation when we can't make this incompressible assumption. So how do we deal with this equation for compressible fluids? Okay, so when we needed to solve this and we had the incompressible fluids, we were able to make the right hand side equal to a constant and then it made the integration simple. But in the case of a compressible fluid on the right hand side now we have this rho g term and we know that density is going to vary. Okay so if we want to integrate this but that term on the right is not a constant the only way we can separate this out and do an integration is if the density is either a function of the pressure or the z which are the two terms we have on the left hand side of the equation. Okay now how do we write the density as a function of a pressure or the z-coordinate? Well, many gases behave as ideal gases, as we would have seen previously in thermodynamics, for example. And so we can use the ideal gas relationship to relate then the density and the pressure. So you see that sometimes written as PV equals MRT, or in this case, I can just write the M over V term as density, so P equals rho RT there. Now that works because the density is now written as a function of pressure. However, we've also added temperature in there, which doesn't help us out because now we have to figure out how temperature varies. So one strategy we can use to find a solution to this in a more general case is to say, well, let's look at cases where there's a linear temperature variation. For example, in the atmosphere, there's a linear temperature variation with the altitude. And so we can then express the temperature as a function of the Z coordinate. And we remember we can integrate this so long as we have all the terms as a function of pressure or Z. Okay, so we write the linear temperature profile as follows as a function of Z here. So then I want to sub everything in which we do on the line below. So we break up out the TP and DZ derivative, sub in using the ideal gas law for the density, and then we sub in our linear temperature distribution. Okay, so now we separate and integrate, and a reminder that we still treat the uh, gravity term as constant. 
So now we've solved for the pressure distribution in a gas when you have a linear temperature variation. So remember, when you look at an equation like this, it's critically important that we understand how we came up with this equation. So this is only going to be applicable when we have that linear temperature variation. And now we want to dissect this a little bit more. So we look at our engineering understanding of, of these mathematical terms here. And they're written just two different ways of writing the same thing. But if we look at the one on the right here, so we see in this case, we want to look at how the pressure varies. And what's shown on the right there is that it's a function, in this case, of the temperature. And only if temperature varies in Z do we have that Z variation. Now this is generally why we say that gases can be treated as incompressible without much density variation if there's not a big temperature change. But if there's a big temperature change, we therefore expect a large change in pressure and we have to account for that. This also helps us to explain one quick approximation I made earlier. We looked at and I said the portion with air, we can treat the pressure to be uniform throughout that. And now when we've looked at gases now, we see why that is. So long as there's not a big temperature change throughout the air portion in the manometer, we can just treat that as having one uniform constant pressure. And this analysis has shown us why, because pressure is only a function of temperature in this case. Okay, now to finish off this video, what I do here is to do an example to show you how to calculate the pressure difference in a multiple liquid manometer because for me, the examples are really necessary in understanding the material. So I like to do this side by side because now we can take all these equations and calculate actual numbers with actual heights for a real scenario. I think that really cements the understanding of what we've just learned here in this lecture. So I'm gonna do this as a separate video file because students in the past have asked to have these as separate files for convenience, as I mentioned before, but I strongly recommend you watch that right now. If you've just finished this video, it's important to see me solve this example and I'll go through this in a lot of detail. Okay, so I'll wrap up video four here then with a quick summary. So we started section two, so that's fluid statics. So this is calculating the forces in fluids that aren't moving. So that's basically a balance between body force, gravity, and the pressure force. We looked at the core equation of fluid statics that tells us how the gravity force caused the pressure to increase as you go deeper in a fluid. And then we looked at how to calculate the pressure variation in a static fluid. And now, as I mentioned, the example that I'm going to do is a multiple liquid manometer in the next video. And that that really ties together with this video here. Okay, so that's all for video four. Thanks for watching.